being a scientist, one should always start with disclaimers. When <clears throat> Dr. Dawson asked me to do this, she said, oh, and I'll even give you um, a slide deck that I've used. So oh, how could I say no to that? But the important thing is that um, this is uh, Liza Dawson's slide deck. It's, it's excellent, but um, it isn't mine. And I want you guys just to know for full disclosure that I am um, coasting on her, her good work here. All right, and you know, as, as mentioned before, stop me anytime. And just, you know, I, I probably won't follow the chats as carefully um, as Beza will, but uh, just, you know, I, I'm okay, just interrupt if you want a little more detail. So what we're gonna talk about are what are clinical trials? What's the, um, the clinical trial pathway? Um, phase one trials, phase two and three, what all this means in terms of going from the very beginning of thinking about a concept and getting something tested uh, in humans and then what we do afterwards, because most people don't know what a, what a phase four is. If you've heard about these trial phases, most folks only have heard about phase three, meaning that it's sufficient information for a national regulatory authority like in our country, the FDA, to say, okay, good to go. This vaccine um, or, or other product is now approved. But it doesn't end there. The, the ongoing studies continue. And in some cases, drugs or vaccines or devices that are approved can actually be taken off the market if long-term studies were to give us information that they don't work as well as we thought um, or they cause harm or both. Next slide, please. Okay, so the clinical trial is a research study that's done in people. And typically, we're talking about a treatment that is new so that it is something that will advance medical science. I will tell you having sat on, on a bioethics commission under Mr. Obama for seven years, the very first thing that you have to ask yourself is whether or not the question you wanna ask using human volunteers is scientifically so important that you're willing to put people at any degree of risk so the first level of, of whether or not a study is ethical or not is really whether or not the question is worth asking in the first place. And I think that's something that a lot of people that even do what I do for a living sometimes forget. The first step of bioethics is whether or not you should even be asking the question. And if the answer is no, it's just not really gonna help us, you stop there, it's not ethical. Um, that surprises a lot of people because sometimes you'll have folks that say, well, this is pretty cool, I learned this study in a." different uh, model and now I want to test it in people and the first response should be why what are you going to learn how is that going to help us and uh, that's important to know next slide please okay so this just shows you the pathway sometimes you'll hear people use the term from laboratory bench to clinical bedside this is basically what the whole process is the whole scientific research enterprise goes from discovery Sometimes you'll hear that described as basic science, right? So geeky lab work that people do that um, is not obviously done in human volunteers. It's done either in test tubes, sometimes in small or larger animals, but it's, um, it's bench science. And then you go into a period which is called development. Now that means that, let's say that you do that basic science and you're like, hmm, that's interesting. We actually have something here that we think could benefit humankind. And so, you go through a process of, uh, of doing clinical trials. Yeah, that's good because it's, all right. And then you go through a, a process of evaluating that uh, product, but at the end of the day, you have to deliver it. Now, if you wanna give a real life uh, example, there are now three vaccines that have emergency use, vaccine, uh, emergency use authorization, which means a, a, an initial approval by the FDA. That's Moderna, Pfizer, and now Johnson or Johnson & Johnson. So those have gone through the process of discovery and development and are now actually being delivered as public health tools. But the story isn't over there because those vaccines have not received their full approval from the US FDA, which, which in a nutshell really means you need six full months of safety data, six full months. Um, so you're gonna see those first two vaccines that were approved, Moderna and Pfizer, once they hit those six month uh, benchmarks, they're gonna roll into a period where they actually get full FDA approval. But I think the important thing for us to understand is that 
it's not it's not good enough to, to, to make a public health tool available and get it to you know supply points. At the end of the day, if it's, if it's a vaccine, it only counts once it gets into people's arms, right? So the the old saying is it isn't vaccines that save people, it's vaccinations, right? So this is really important. And, and for the, our community advisory boards across the entire enterprise, you have to ask yourself, and some of these questions actually came up during the discussion but before you invited me to speak, which are that building trust in communities, especially tr communities that don't have much trust in the medical system have been predated in the past. You're thinking about things like Tuskegee or Guatemala then getting those individuals, especially if they're at higher risk, which is definitely true, FICOP communities are, have been well established that those communities are much greater, at much greater risk for becoming infected in the first place and having a bad outcome if they do. So again, at the end of the day, the delivery is really, really important. And if community isn't engaged at every level of discovery, of developing the products, and then finally, getting to the point where you're asking people to, 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 to take a new product. Uh, community is absolutely vital during the entire life cycle of this enterprise. And this is that particular comment that community is in, it needs to be engaged during the entire life cycle of, of, a, of a product development is something that is a core tenet of good participatory practices that UNAIDS and AVAC promulgated over 12 years ago and uh, continues to this day. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is really the meat of the matter. <clears throat> um, you probably have heard about phase one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. um, FDA approval at some levels, and there's a nuance there with this now new emergency use authorization. It's not really super new, but it was really new for vaccines. Um, it, it was the sort of approach that was used a lot in AIDS medicine to make sure that if a new drug was available, especially <clears throat> in the early part of the, of the um, pandemic when we were using a first, first a single and then double drug therapy and resistance was developing very quickly. There was a huge push from the community to be able to get the FDA to speed up and do accelerated approvals. And emergency use authorization was part of that thought, thought process of modernizing the way the FDA looked at um, experiments done in people and would, um, would moderate the risk to get what looked to be a promising uh, intervention out into the community faster. Okay. <clears throat> So a phase one study is the first in human studies that you do with either a drug or a vaccine. And your thought really is all about safety, okay? So you do get other information from a phase one trial. If it's a drug, you get to measure its level in the blood. If it's a drug, you take orally. If it's a vaccine, you get to look at how the uh, host immune response does its thing and, and you measure those things uh, as well. But first and foremost, this is your first look as, as to whether or not something is safe. Now, recognize that most phase one studies are in the range of 50 to 150 people. Sometimes they're a little bit bigger, but usually they're, they're pretty small. So if you've got something that is a terrible um, thing that could happen, but it, you only see it one time in 500, and you, you're doing phase one studies in the range of about 100, the chance you're gonna see a bad outcome that's relatively unusual, like you know, one chance in 500 is pretty low. So really got to be careful about talking about phase one studies establishing safety. They're the first look at safety, but they're not the end. So that's where the phase two trials come in. Phase two trials are usually done in hundreds of individuals, and they give you a better idea about safety. Now, again, I'd say the same thing. If a vaccine is going to do something dreadful, one chance in a million, are you gonna see it in a phase two study of 500 people? Um, probably not. So it incrementally takes you down the pathway to say, okay, what we learned in the phase one in terms of safety and the science, the science uh, is now validated in this phase two study. And then finally you go to a phase three study. In COVID-19, these studies are typically in the range of about 30,000 individuals, okay? And they established with scientific rigor, greater amounts of safety. And for the first time, really asked the question, does this product work in the intended use of this product? <clears throat> now you might remember from conversations we had earlier, Moderna was, um, was funded by the US government, uh, Pfizer was not. But in the early days of Moderna's run up to its phase one and then into its phase three trial, their initial, uh, 
diversity and inclusivity, if you looked at, at who was being enrolled, was not very good. It was basically white people and younger white people. Um, and the real concern there was the intended use of this vaccine was for it to be able to work in all communities, especially in the United States, whose taxpayers were bearing the brunt of the funding, but worldwide as well. And so there was a huge pressure put on Moderna by the US federal government to say, you need to meet no less than the population. So if you, know, you look at Latinx and black and American Indian Alaska native populations in the United States, you need to go no lower than those percentages, right? Now, understanding that those communities have disproportional impact um, of these diseases, you could make the argument that in fact, probably over half of the enrollees in those kinds of studies um, probably should be from communities of color because that's where the greatest need is. So there's lots of discussion about that. I will tell you that I've never seen that level of pressure. This is Tony Fauci Collins, the head of, of the NIH um, and, and the head of NIID in Fauci's case, really making a passionate, um, not a plea, but telling these companies, this is our money, you're gonna do it the right way. So I think really that kind of reset the, the idea that you would just do these studies as fast as you could, and you would not really worry about issues of diversity and inclusivity, because that's kind of a nice to have. In this particular case, not only was it not a nice to have, it was a must have, right? The intended use of, this, <clears throat> um, of these kinds of vaccines, it's critical on everybody, but we know that the most vulnerable amongst us were from, were from communities of color. So I think that's really an important point to, um, you know, to understand is that you know, the community forces in our uh, country have really have reset the benchmark for going forward how we should do studies. The FDA has responded, and for the first time ever, has issued guidelines to the pharmaceutical industry saying that you need to address diversity and inclusivity as a tenet of developing a product for its intended use, right? Um, and that's, I think, you know, a, really a, a huge battle that was won. Okay, now next is, is the FDA approval. And we've talked about this sort of shorter term FDA approval called an emergency use authorization. And that basically says the clinical need, the public health need is so strong that we'll take six months, uh, we'll, we'll take much shorter amounts of information. And, and the way it worked in COVID is the FDA said, we'll take the median number of people in your study, roughly 30,000 people, we'll take the median number. So roughly 15,000 of those that you followed for two months. And if the efficacy of the vaccine looks good in that population and it looks safe, then we'll give it initial approval. But you need to come back to us at the six month mark when everyone's been followed for six months and then we'll consider the final approval, which is called a BLA or a, a biological license uh, application. So understand that that's not the end though. So phase four is what most folks never hear about. And that is the FDA continues, continues to monitor after initial approval to say, okay, now that you've got vaccine in tens of millions of people, is it still safe? Is it still effective? And so the FDA, and this is true for national regulatory authorities anywhere in the world. So if you're in Uganda or Mozambique or Japan, it's the same idea, which is that a company makes a deal, a handshake with a national regulatory authority. That's how it works, right? And so that, so any given country can say, I'll approve this vaccine, whereas another country may not. And you've already seen that with AstraZeneca. The United Kingdom has already approved that vaccine and we're still waiting for more data. So that sort of stuff happens and it doesn't mean that one country is more slipshod than the other. It's just at the end of the day, you know, governments that serve their people need to be responsive to them. And in the UK, it was considered that our public health crisis was of such a magnitude that they were willing to take that step and we weren't at that point. All right, next slide. All right, so before a phase one trial begins, and this is exactly what um, our team here at RARE is living, as you know, with a phase one study that you're involved in, that we test the drug and the device in laboratory studies. We've done that in small and larger animals. We are finding out as much as possible about whether or not this makes sense. In other words, going back to my, my comment earlier, is the juice worse the squeeze? Should we be asking this question? Is there still a public health emergency that we need it? 
And I can tell you that the critical point about the vaccine that you're helping us test is that this vaccine looks really, really good at going after these variants that you're hearing about on the news so much, these variants of concern. We had hoped that our vaccine would be like that. We had designed it so that it would be more general against other coronaviruses, and that seems to be the case. So we believe now more than ever that this vaccine makes sense and that we're therefore the question is worth asking scientifically, so it's ethical. Um, and a large pharmaceutical company, Sanofi Pasteur, agrees with us and is now intensely interested in following along with us. And we're in the, in the middle of setting up a partnership so that they, will be, that they will begin to fund the subsequent steps that we would do to go to phase two and, and, and beyond. So as we said before, you know, the phase one trial really first and foremost looks at safety. It looks at what you might call biological effects, since I've mentioned that either could be if it's a vaccine, what it does to your immunity. If it's a drug, you look at drug levels and you continue to develop the scientific case. This makes sense to continue down that phase one, two, three, and four pathway. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is actually a picture of our old pilot bioproduction facility. If you could look behind me, if there was a window there, you'd see it. And this is where we actually make, uh, in this case, we're talking about a vaccine, and this is where we actually make that product. And I will tell you that the FDA and all kinds of other uh, folks look over our shoulder, making sure that what we're doing is that the product itself is rigorously uh, safe, that they, we have to prove that it is what we think it was, that it is, uh, doesn't carry any extra funk in it, that um, you know, it really is as pure as we can make it, and that we've done all the additional toxicity studies to make sure that bad things don't happen in, um, in, lower, in, in smaller um, uh, animal studies. And so this is something the FDA looks over our shoulder with. We were um, working on this really for almost a year to get to this point to, to, to do this. And it only is just recently in the past uh, few weeks that the heavy lift from what we're doing with the FDA has shifted from making this product, because we've now made over a thousand doses of it, and the FDA is like, good to go, you're okay to, to take this into humans. Now the heavy lift is on what we call, um, you know, on getting into the phase one, we had to come up with a, a packet to present to the FDA, which we just did last Friday. So they're gonna spend the next two to four weeks looking at it. Now amongst the things they're looking at is all the data that came from, did, did we make this product in a safe fashion? Are they convinced that it's safe to go into humans? So I think that's important to understand because there's a really a ton of work that goes in, even during a crisis, to making sure we, we don't do um, harm. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so I probably said this now five times, but it's good to keep on saying it. How does that trial work? You guys are living this uh, right now with us. First, purpose of this phase one is to find out if our product is safe, which is why that, you know, we're going to actually use two dose levels, a smaller and a larger dose. We're going to initially take volunteers and give them a smaller amount of this vaccine and then make sure that there aren't any safety problems. And then that's going to be looked at by an independent group. Um, and that's also important that this isn't just us saying, oh, look, it looks fine. You can't self-declare that. Another independent group, in this case, it's, you know, the, it's called the trial sponsor. In this case, the trial sponsor is actually um, the U.S. Army at our higher command, and they, uh, they report directly to the FDA. They're the go-between. And they are assuming the risk that, that if we don't do things right, it's going to be on them. So they are all over us to making sure that we have uh, done everything that we need to do to make sure that um, we are approaching safety in this trial in the right way. So again, investigators can't self-declare that everything's fine. Someone else has to. Now, I'll get into more of that when we talk about phase threes. Okay. Um, now, typically in a phase one trial, you're involving healthy volunteers because you really want to say in the best case scenario, right, we want to take healthy people and we want to see if this vaccine is safe for them, yes or no. And now, it may well be that those are the kind of people that will never get this vaccine. They don't need it. Um, that's why the last point is important. It's why we go through a careful informed consent procedure, because there is no expectation that if you are involved in a phase one, that you personally will get benefited from it. 
Now that's an important bioethical principle. I will tell you that because of COVID being so prevalent, especially in our country, you know, that, that, that equipoise has shifted a bit, right? And, and I will tell you that getting individuals that wanna sign up for a COVID vaccine trial um, has not been difficult for anyone that's, that's been doing it because people want to be in a position to help. Um, I should say, Eliza, I'm not sure if you saw the links that uh, Sally Bach developed from the CoVPN. I just saw them yesterday, but there's some really, really good um, media outreach pieces that talk about diversity and inclusivity, especially in volunteers for trials and how basically they should be thanked for what they did because they moved the ball so quickly, you know, for those that are most vulnerable. Um, let me know if you, if you haven't seen those links, I can get them to you. But I, I, I think the community advisory board, if they haven't seen them, really would benefit from taking a look at those. They were really well done. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so if there are any negative changes in someone's health in the context of a trial, it's referred to as an adverse event. And it's, it's evaluated, again, it's evaluated by the investigative team, but it's also um, pushed up so it's evaluated by independent individuals. And they get classified in, in uh, different ways from, you know, uh, adverse events that are really bad. And those are, those are all spelled out in the protocol. So we don't have to think, is this, is this just an adverse event or is it a severe adverse event? Um, and so there are, you know, standard forms that are used so that, um, across the trial landscape, everyone will, will know. But you have to declare up front what you believe will be an adverse event, what is, what is a severe adverse event. Um, and these are really important because certain of uh, severe adverse events have triggers where the trial is immediately stopped. And um, then everyone huddles to include the FDA if it's that serious. And the trial could stop at that point. And um, it might go forward depending on what's learned. And you probably heard in the news that AstraZeneca had some of those problems when they were doing their study. And they had some stops because of people developing transverse myelitis and other kinds of diseases. So, and they, so you had to figure out whether or not that was just, you know, happenstance. So if I like break my leg after I get vaccinated by this product, because I was walking to my car and slipped on black ice, it's probably not related to the vaccine, it's related to the fact that I'm an idiot, but you know, but okay. That, but I, again, you can't self-declare that. Someone else has to say, well, maybe he got dizzy. So now you, now you have to work me up. And I say two hours into the vaccine, I got really dizzy and I got blurry vision and I was trying to get to my car and then I slipped on the ice. Well, that doesn't sound so mechanical, does it? And that's why, again, it's so important for somebody else outside of the investigative team to make a decision about what gets reported up and what doesn't. Next slide, please. Um, just wanted to pause here, Dr. Michael, if you don't mind, and see sure. if anyone has any question so far. Well, someone wants the links, I know that. <laughs> yeah, well, um, if you can send those links to me, I'll be happy to share them with them in the follow-up. Okay. If there are no questions, we're going to go ahead and continue then. Okay, so, um, so here are some examples in vaccine trials, like soreness or redness, swelling, where you get the vaccine. And I got my uh, Club Moderna times two, and I can tell you, I got that. Um, and these kinds of reactions are expected, and they're not usually of uh, much concern. And if you're testing a drug, uh, then you may have other kinds of, of things that we look at. Um, I, for example, drugs sometimes can cause uh, damage to your organs. So you can look at tests that look at how your liver is doing, how your kidney is doing, et cetera. And again, there are very, very standard safety tables so that um, we don't, we don't, we again, we don't declare what's not that important what is. These are, you know, standard practice that's done. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so uh, yeah, I can go, go back one. There you go. Remember, I was telling you before, like I slipped on the ice, right? It didn't sound like it was related, but if you ask a few questions, I slipped because I was dizzy a couple hours after getting the vaccine. Still doesn't say that's related to the vaccine, but it makes you a little bit more nervous that it might. So here's sort of the pathway for how we try to figure out if, if an adverse events are related to the product that you got or not. 
um, investigators and, and independent medical monitors are checking you know, these records for adverse events very closely. So amongst the things they might wanna look at is prior evidence from similar products or trials. So if a vaccine that we're giving has been one that we've modified a little bit, but previously we've learned that it causes people to be dizzy, that's something that's important. If I have an individual medical history of, of having vertigo, then that's something that begins to take you away from thinking that maybe this was related. Um, if there's a, if it makes sense, biological rationale means, does it make sense? So if I slip on the ice, because I was dizzy and my, my vision was blurry and I wasn't paying attention, that probably makes biological sense. On the other hand, if I have really no symptoms like that, but I'm involved in a motor vehicle accident, it's probably no biological plausibility for me texting while driving, not that I would ever do that, um, and then getting into an accident that has nothing to do with me being in a vaccine trial, it has me being a bad father and not listening to you know good advice. So uh, this is you know the, these are real world issues and and sometimes it's not easy to sort them out, which is why you need a, a team to look at it. Also, the timing is is important in relationship to when the person received the product. So if um, I and mean, this is, a, I'll give you a real, a real world example. In a vaccine study being done by the federal government, a, um, two volunteers. So what we heard is that people developed high blood pressure after getting their vaccination, okay? And they developed it almost immediately after being given the vaccine. Now that's really weird. As a doctor, I'm thinking, well, how could that happen so quickly? You know, unless they rip their skin and cause a lot of pain, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and then we learned that actually that the person who developed this high blood pressure doesn't kind of like doctors too much, doesn't like to see white coats, has start white coat syndrome. And this person had that problem. And the person, there was a second individual, happened to be at the same site and watched the first person freak out. So now we got two. And so they were both sent to the emergency room. They were reassured their blood pressure came down with any specific therapies. So they just got freaked out. One person got freaked out because that's sort of a pattern they've had in their life. And their person saw that, you know, the, you know, if someone comes out of the room and they're screaming, that doesn't give you a lot of confidence either. So these are, again, that's a, that is that literally happened three weeks ago. But those sort of things have to be sorted out and the team has to think about it. Now, what the, what the company did is they stopped the trial for, for about 36 hours while they sorted that out, pushed it up to about two dozen people and asked their opinion, okay? So it didn't make biological sense and the timing didn't make sense either for it to be related, but the timing made a lot of sense for it to be just folks getting nervous. And so um, that was important to learn. Okay, so because of the importance of safety for all of us, there are independent monitors that look at this. Um, in, a, in a safety, in, in, a, in a phase one trial, we don't have an independent, I'm going to the end of the slide, we don't have an independent data and safety monitoring board that's usually the province of phase three trials, but this is really important to know, is that, so in phase one, we actually do have a safety committee that the sponsor has up north, our parent command has an independent group of people that are looking at all our information. And when you go, when you go into a phase two sometimes and a phase three always, you will have this independent DSMB. Now those guys are very powerful and critically, they will look at the unblinded data. So they know who's getting vaccine. They know who's getting placebo. They'll also look at the, the data that comes from efficacy, then they can make decisions about whether or not the trial should consider, even if it's totally safe, it's just not working. They'll say, look, statistically, we can tell you even now, don't bother, this is not gonna work. So um, that, that's important. It's more important than phase three trials. And we'll, I'll touch on that when we get to there, but that's important. Next slide, please. Um, before we move on, if do you mind uh, explaining what DSMB is, just for those of us who are not um, familiar yeah, it, with that terminology? The, yeah, sorry. In the lower right corner, it spells it out, the Data and Safety Monitoring Board. Okay. D so they look at the, the data that comes from the trial and they look at the safety. So the two major things they look out over is, um, is something safe? And so if you have something terrible that happens in a clinical trial, that's a safety signal. Sometimes it's, it's easy to figure out, sometimes it's not. 
if you have like 60 sites involved, and this is this is about 60 to up to 250 sites were involved in some of the trials that, that have led to approval of vaccines like Pfizer and Johnson and Johnson and, and Moderna. So if you have safety blips that any individual investigator might not really think that's that important, but in aggregate looks really bad, that's the job of the DSMB to look at all this data and say, wait a minute. It wasn't just one or two people having a panic attack at one site. It's 20% of folks across the entire spectrum of this trial. That's different, right? And so that's why um, having a completely independent group looking at this information, and they, in fact, are not blinded. Everybody else is. So they can determine if, if of the 20% of people that got freaked out, if, if half of them got the vaccine and half of them got placebo, okay, that probably doesn't, you know, that's probably not inherently worrisome. But if 90% of the people who got freaked out had the vaccine, that's something different. All right. So that's why it's so important to have an independent data safety and monitoring board. Typically in small trials, it's not done. There just isn't enough, um, you know, typically if you're going to find something out, it's a single site or a small number of sites, like two or three. And, you know, you really don't need that extra level of, of, of control. And there's no data to look at for safety for, uh, sorry, for efficacy, because you're not trying to ask that question. Um, and and if you, the last thing I'll say is if you look at the trials that were done for COVID, they're looking at elderly. They're looking at people like high risk for developing these diseases with lots of other medical problems. And so there were lots of folks having issues in these clinical trials. And so in some cases, you'd expect it. If you would enroll people with heart disease, you might have people with heart attacks in these trials. Because so, so as you toward, as you get toward the a phase three where you're testing in a population of intended use, you're much more likely to have problems. In some cases that may be associated with vaccines, some it may not. Next slide, please. Uh, we have a question, just one uh, from Jenny Lynn. She asks, um, have we started uh, human clinical trials with, with our vaccine? Nope, we have just submitted last Friday to the US Food and Drug Administration. If they give us the green light, um, we will have our first volunteer get their first shot about the 6th of April. But that's assuming that the FDA looks at the package, everyone agrees, um, and we, but that's the earliest that we would start. Okay, so blinding and clinical trials, why do we do this and what does it mean? So most phase one, two trials, um, you know, most of them are using what are called control groups that get placebo, which means an inactive product. Um, and a lot of those trials are blinded because what it means is that no one's biased. In other words, if you are a volunteer and you know you're getting an active product, you might go home saying, oh, what was that little pain? Was that, oh, I know I got the active product. Maybe that was associated, right? Um, that's why it's so important, especially for really common kinds of symptoms like getting, getting excited or getting nervous or getting a little bit dizzy. That's why it's so important to have a substantial number of people. Usually, it's about half, but so, sometimes it's not. You can you can you can adjust the fraction of people that don't get the active product. But it's really important because for really common symptoms, if you don't have uh, blinding and if you don't have you know the control that's done, you really can get in trouble. You can basically throw out something that's bad um, for no good reason. So blinding means that the participants and the study staff they don't know who's gotten an active product and who doesn't. Um, in the best designs, the staff that deliver the vaccine, the, um, the investigative team, the volunteers, nobody knows. It's called double blind because it means that investigative team is group one, they don't know. And the folks that are getting the, um, you know, the product, the clinical, clinical trial volunteers, they don't know either. So that's the second group, both blinded. So I told you earlier that if there are troubles, then um, you immediately need to make sure that, um, you know, a decision can be made as to whether or not the trial should be unblinded or not. All right, that's important. So that's, yeah, I think I kind of have, have done that. It basically, from, from, a, from if you're a statistician, this is the sort of thing that makes sure that um, you're completely unbiased. You know, it's like, it's the same reason why we show Lady Justice, you know, holding her scales and, 
and she's has a blindfold on because she will make decisions and the law should make decisions based on the facts, not based on prejudices. Well, I won't go down that rabbit hole right now. Next slide, please. What if someone <laughs> is, wants to actually uh, know what they're getting? Um, is, is that option not available to participants if? if well, it's, yeah, I mean, so it's something that we very carefully go with, go over with, with participants saying that we need to keep them blinded to keep the study scientifically valid. So remember that goes back to my first question. If, if we basically said, oh, we feel bad, we wanna let everyone know kind of what, what, what you got because you're curious. Then all of a sudden the study's not, is not, you know, it's not worthwhile to do. And now it becomes unethical. Because I go back to my first, um, you know, my, my first point, which is if you can't ask a scientifically important question, then it's not ethical to do the study. You're putting people at some degree of risk, even if it's a teeny risk, you're putting them at risk. And so you have to explain that to volunteers so that they understand that going into the trial, they're not gonna know, but they also need to be informed, and they are in our study, that if there's a reason for them to be unblinded, again, something terrible happens, and the medical monitor says, oh my gosh, we have to figure this out right now. And, and especially if it has to do with the health of the volunteer. If there was some rationale for a treating physician to, to know, because now, now let's say you're in our study and you may have a doctor like a majority involved, but then you get ill and you now go see your regular doctor and they say, we need to know what you got, vaccine or placebo, you know, that sort of uh, process uh, would lead to unblinding. So in general, we make sure that the volunteers understand what they're, what they're signing up for. I think Liza put a comment here. Um, yeah, she says that one, well, this is important. One exception being made now, I mean, this is, this is something that we're, that we and others that are doing vaccine trials in the current era where UA vaccines are available, is that if a person decides in our trial, now they want an, EUF, an EUA vaccine, they can ask to be unblinded. So, you know, it's just, um, at, at the end of the day, we wanna protect the integrity of the trial, but we also have to have respect for persons and everybody, you know, you, so there, there may be scenarios like what Liza brought up that are important in that sense. I have a question. What is, what is U, EUA? What is it means that? a use authorization. It's that ah, okay. initial level of approval that the FDA will say. They'll say, we will grant you authority now, but we're going to come back to you when you have a more safety follow-up, six months of follow-up, and it, with everybody, not just two months of follow-up and half your folks. There are other things they do too, honestly. They look at, um, remember I showed you that picture of a pilot buyer production facility? The other thing that full approval does is that the company that's making the product has to pass really rigorous checks to make sure that the batch they make today is gonna be the same as the batch they can make six months from now. And they're held to an even higher standard um, under the full approval. The full approval is called a biological license application or BLA. The, the terms are confusing. You can sort of see it as initial followed by um, more definitive approval, understanding at any time the FDA can, can, can pull that approval based on what they learn subsequently. And that's happened. It happens in, 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 you know, in medicine all the time. Approvals are, are taken back once more information comes. Okay, next slide, please. You guys having fun yet? All right, so now, now you move to through a phase two. Phase two means that you've gotten your initial safety information and the data that the biological information looks good. And so now we're saying, okay, we want to basically ask for a larger number of people to be enrolled, making sure that we haven't missed a problem that we might have picked up in hundreds of people that we missed in you know, dozens. Um, and so it's important, and Liza notes this, most products that, that, that go through phase one don't get into phase two. And there are lots of reasons for that. One could be that the product has got too many side effects, um, or it just didn't work. That it looked great when you tested it in the test tube, 
but then you went into people and eh, it's nothing burger, you know, and that happens too. Let's hope it doesn't happen to our vaccine, but it might. And lastly, the product might not be feasible to use in the population that really needs it. Okay. So, um, you know, there's another point there that I would throw in, which is sometimes the company says, you know, we're not going to do it. We're not going to invest the amount of money um, into doing this. And for us, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. And, you know, going soup to nuts for a phase to, to get a product into even emergency use authorization was about a billion dollars. The, F, the um, U.S. government gave in that range of money anywhere from as low as a half billion to as much as two and a half billion. Billion for the B. Each of the companies that's being supported to make COVID-19 vaccines. So think about that for a second. So if you're a company and your phase one trial looks, eh, looks you know, not so great, your CEO is going to go, sorry, brother, sorry, sister, we ain't doing this. Man, juice ain't worth the squeeze. So that's another reason why trials will be stopped at phase one because, um, you know, I can, I can tell you that this happened to us and we tested a vaccine for Zika. Um, made in our pilot bioproduction facility, tested in our clinical trial center, looked really good. But what was happening with Zika, by the time we got to do that clinical trial, Zika um, was not as much of a problem um, anywhere, even, even in certain places where it had become a big problem, like in, in Amazonia, it wasn't as much of a problem anymore. And so the company we were working with uh, said, sorry, we're not going to take it any further. It looks great, and maybe we'll come back to you one day. But right now, it makes no sense to go forward. Okay. So um, once again, if you want to go forward to a phase two, you can't just let science rip. The FDA has to agree. And they will go back and look at your phase one data and make a decision. Next slide, please. So here's phase two. We've already kind of mentioned this. So just larger numbers of people. You get a lot more information about safety. You get a lot more information about the biological kinds of responses that might be good. Um, I will tell you though, again, think hard. Phase two trial, maybe five, 600 people. If you're looking at something really bad that happens one time out of 2000, you're not gonna see it, right? That's why you have to keep on going. All right, next slide. And speaking of which, yeah, go ahead. We have a quick, quick question, how long, in, in traditional, traditionally speaking, how long do we stay within a phase? How long does it take for yeah. phase one to phase two for, to phase three? What is the, the frame? Yeah. All right. The sad truth is under the traditional paradigms, it used to take roughly seven years <clears throat> to go from thought process to phase one, two, and three, okay, to get approval. It was like a seven to 10 year process. And that's been greatly shortened. As you can see, we did that in about a year with uh, the current vaccines. And part of it was because we used innovative approaches to um, like mRNA vaccines, which up until the time they were used for uh, COVID-19 had been an active field of, of investigation, but drug companies weren't really investing that much in it because they were using the other older platforms. The major reason why things work so fast in COVID is that drug companies, of course, they're for-profit companies. And they're going to take a really slow process of going down from phase one, two, and three, seven years. Um, and they're not going to rush into things because they don't want to lose a lot of money. So in comes the federal government that says, uh, uh, Pfizer is different. Pfizer put its own money in. But the rest of the companies didn't. So the U.S. government comes in and says, we will give you a billion dollars with a B. If you go all in, make you know huge amounts of this uh, vaccine before you prove it would even work. You will make tons of it, so that when it does work, we will immediately be able to use it as a public health tool. That almost never happens. You have to go back to the 1950s with polio and the March of Dimes. I mean, I'm old enough to remember that. I took my sugar sugar cube in first grade, but most people don't know what that is. It's ancient history. So. It does happen, and the reason why we move so fast is that taxpayer money was put at risk, not people. And that's, I think that's really important to know, is yes, we can move much faster than seven years if you use innovative technologies like mRNA vaccine. 
mean, because you can think about it to actually having a pure amount of vaccine to test in 41 days with, a, with, a, with these newer kinds of approaches to make vaccines. That's stunning, right? So you, we can now do in a year what used to take seven years. And I think that's important to, to recall. Okay, so, yeah. One more question. We, Cortland asks, can participants move from phase one to phase, phase two? Usually not. Usually if you've been involved in phase one, you're not involved in the phase two. It's because you typically want individuals that have never seen that product before, right? Because if something bad happens to people who get a vaccine four times and they would never get that in the real world, right? So, you know, then that's, that can not be such a good thing. So typically, if you were involved in phase one, thank you for your service. If you were involved in a phase two, thank you for your service. And the same with the phase three. So typically there are different populations. And I think some of that is, is also good because you know, if you're going to beat a company up for not having diversity and inclusivity in 75 people, all right, I mean, that's one thing. But now they're going into hundreds of people and they still haven't worked out diversity and inclusivity. I would, that's when, you know, you don't spare the rod as much. In phase three, I, I actually would take the approach that was unethical. So, you know, you also want to, to be able to give, you know, the folks that are doing the vaccine trials the most flexibility to do the right thing. And that was really important for Moderna because Moderna early on was sort of doing vaccine trials the way that they had typically been done by industry, which is the fastest and easiest populations that you could work in, which tended to be super white. And that wasn't cool. So, but yeah, in, in general, if you're involved in, in any of these phases, you're one and done. Uh, but but I, I think that preserves people's safety, honestly, too. Um, and which is not to say that if you were involved in a malaria vaccine trial, you couldn't sign up for an HIV vaccine trial or then sign up for a Zika trial. So that sort of thing can be done. But typically, you don't get the same product again. Thank you. And I do want to um, give a 10 minutes warning here. Um, we have 10 minutes. Okay. Let's go to phase three. Okay. We'll do it in 10 minutes. Phase two trials are really big. This is really the, th this is the bottom line. This is what you're trying to get to. Because this is, these are tens of thousands of individuals typically, and you test a vaccine or a drug, and typically it's done against a placebo, but that's not always the case. And that's, I think, something I want to point out here. Because let's say that now you're coming up with a new, um, a new vaccine you want to test in the United States, and you already have some that are approved, right? So then how do you come in with a, with a new vaccine? <clears throat> if you have a standard of care, and most would say an EUA is not standard of care, but people are, just aren't gonna sign up for a, a trial unless they get something like that. Um, then you would have to do a, a study against a known um, product that works, right? So you're testing, it's probably easier to talk about outside of COVID. So let's say you're talking about a, a new drug for hypertension. You don't test it against placebo, in a phase three trial, you test it against a drug that you know works. Um, and then you do what's typically called um, a study of looking at whether or not, it's because it's really hard statistically to prove that a new drug is so much better. You want to prove that it's not any le less, you know, it's basically equivalent. And those are called non-inferiority studies. So there's lots of stuff we could talk about, not in 10 minutes, but really this is the cornerstone of a phase three trial because this is what the uh, Food and Drug Administration wants to see before they're willing to say, okay, we're gonna give you initial approval to take this and make it a public health tool. Okay, and that's when companies can start selling it. Or in the, in the case of COVID, the US government buys it and you get it usually, usually for free. Okay, next slide. All right, so these trials are, 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 are done in a randomized way, meaning that um, you basically, people come into the trial, and you essentially roll a dice, flip a coin. There are more sophisticated ways of doing it, but it's essentially that concept. And, you know, some people are going to get a vaccine, some are going to get a placebo. And you do it in a way that's unbiased. Everyone's blinded. Um, the trials are big, so we can see the difference. And you have this data safety monitoring board looking over your shoulder, asking constantly, is it working? Is it causing harm? Is it working? Is it causing harm? And they could get to some point 
in the trial and saying, look, we're going to tell you statistically, if this vaccine was ever going to work, you would have seen it by now. So stop the study. Or they can say, this vaccine is causing harm. It's actually causing more COVID, not less. And so stop the study because it's not safe. Or they can say, wow, this is a blockbuster. This thing's unbelievable. You thought it was going to be 50% effective. It's 95%. So stop the study now because you have learned more than you ever thought you would, and it would be unethical to continue. You need to then, you know, um, unblind the study, let folks know who got what, if they want to know that, and, and offer, you know, vaccine to the placebo group, um, which is pretty typical, um, typically done. Okay. And that's, uh, we can go on to the next point, because that's basically what I was talking about. And this is basically how you measure endpoints. Now, this is one, Liza gave me this slide. I was like, whoa, here's something that, that here's a study that, that should stop because you, you intervene in it and four people, you know, have something happens and four people don't, okay? And then in the control group, three people have the same thing happen and, and, and five don't. How can I get much efficacy out of that? That looks like a study that, you know, if those were really big numbers, probably, you know, would be really um, not that efficacious and, you, and it might not. You know, it might not go forward. Next slide, please. Okay, so basically, and I've already gone over this, is, is what you want to know from a phase three trial is that the folks that got the active product, is it effective? Is it better than placebo? Or if you're, if you're comparing it to something else, is it at least as good? Um, if, it has, if it has had no effect at all, that's called futility. You're like, okay, never going to work. And worse, it causes harm. This actually happened in 2008 in a trial done with an HIV vaccine, um, adenovirus 5, it was called the STEP study. And it actually, early on in the study, there was a strong signal in certain people, men who have sex with men who weren't circumcised, to be precise, and those individuals had more chance of developing HIV infection if they got the vaccine or, you know, in the early parts of the study. That was obviously a horrible outcome, but the DSMB caught it and stop the study. Next slide, please. Okay, so FDA approval, we've talked about that. Um, the FDA in our country is the one that makes that decision. And they look at all the information and they make a decision. Now, right now, people are learning more about this than ever, than ever because they're actually watching these really arcane things that used to just happen behind um, you know, closed doors. They're all open. You know, we're seeing the process where the drug company goes to the FDA and you can see in public documents, you can listen in to the determinations and the FDA <clears throat> will tell this committee, wow, we really like this. And the committee then will say, yes, we agree or we don't. And then the product um, information goes to the Centers for Disease Control and it goes to an independent group of academics, largely academics, that say, we agree with the FDA and we think that this should be a public health tool because the FDA can approve a drug. It's the CDC who says how it should be used. And that's why you're seeing those two agencies so much in the news nowadays. Okay. I can probably end with the next slide. Um, oh, well, because the next slide after that is, do I have questions? I talked about a phase four and the really the simple thing, and these are sometimes called pharmacovigilance studies. Gold stars, if you can remember that one. But what this really means is that after a study being done in 30, 40,000 people, you, the FDA has to continue to follow the, the safety and efficacy of the product. Because it might be over time that there are safety signals that we see in one in a million. And a decision has to be made publicly and with debate as to whether or not that's, that's acceptable or not. Is that an acceptable degree of risk? And people need to know. Um, and also, let's just say for sake of argument that these variants continue to be a problem for us, is it possible that the initial vaccines that we made aren't going to work as well? We need to make newer ones and tweak them. So it is also possible that over time, the FDA could say, well, the initial ones that were made by Pfizer and Moderna have now been tweaked. They're new products, slightly modified, and they're really good at getting these new variants. And so we're going to withdraw approval for the first vaccine and we're going to give approval for this. One. So these are real life uh, examples. Phase, so it really never ends. A product can always be withdrawn from the market. The FDA is always looking at this information. And I think that's really important for, 
for people to know is that the, the intent to look at safety and doing the right thing never stops. And with that, I am finished with Liza's most excellent slide deck. And she has some really, um, she has important things on the next slide. I would just show that. Um, there are some um, information. I'm not sure you've seen this before. The NIH has a community engagement program that I, it's relatively new. It's called SEAL, um, which is kind of hard for an army guy to, I mean, why they picked that, you know, SEAL team, they thought that was really clever. But um, there is, the, across the entire NIH, now there's a really vibrant effort to, uh, to do community engagement. And um, I, I must say it involves groups that work on diseases that aren't communicable, not infectious. NHLBI is a real leader here. Um, and this is also heavily involved with the the National Institute of uh, Minority Health and Healthcare Disparities under LSAO um, Perez Stable, uh, as well as the Tribal Health Research Office, which is directly associated with the NIH director. So there's a real treasure trove of information here about doing the right thing in terms of community. And I'd urge you to take a look at some of these things. And I, again, I'll send you the links from the US academic group called the CoVPN, which has, I think, some really good external messaging to volunteers in, in these studies. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Michael. I would like to open it up to, to everyone to, if you have any questions, please, uh, now is your opportunity to, to ask. I'll give you a, a couple of seconds. <laughs> 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 this is great information. I learned so much from this, Dr. Michael. So thank you so much. No test. 